Hello everyone and welcome to the Pennsylvania Earth Science Association with PISA Presents on that underestimated element with many forms, sulfur. Now sulfur is one of those things that mostly anyone with a large collection has a bunch of samples of, but very few times do I go to a show and I see people say having a lot of specimens available or buying a lot of specimens. It's just not that sort of thing that people really collect a lot in bulk which is a shame because really it's a very geologically important substance and also too it can be very extraordinarily beautiful for depending on the source that you look at sulfur can have anywhere from 30 to even possibly over 50 different forms basically crystal layouts what have you and that's an awful lot really when you think about it so let's just look into things and see what's some more things we can figure out so sulfur is of course an element it's atomic number 16. now it was only in 1777 that sulfur was actually isolated fully to the point to where it was chemically determined to be an element but still it's been in use for millennia sulfur is probably one of the first elements that mankind really started working around with and using and it's so plentiful in the earth that it's probably the ninth, possibly the tenth most common element in the earth's makeup. Just period. I mean, there's a lot of sulfur that's in the planet right now. So, well, one thing that you may notice in a lot of sources about sulfur is, is that there's still a bit of confusion as to how you actually spell the name. Is it LF or LPH? Now... So in 1990, some people tell you 1971, but really it's 1990, IUPAC, who are the people that standardize these things? They're the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, settled the whole issue, and as if the title wasn't a dead giveaway, surprise folks, it's actually sulfur. So not to throw Mindat under the bus, but it's not really pH. In some sources, people will say that, oh, pH is the British spelling, or pH is one form of the mineral, and then the F is just for ones that are used in industry. But no, that's not really true. And the pH is actually kind of due to more or less like a typo. So sulfur was always the original spelling of the mineral. Yes, it was pH for a very brief period, but the word sulfur comes from either Latin or Sanskrit, and it came about the first time that it was used, was sometime in the third century. I mean, that's how long people have been writing about sulfur. It was one of the more major elements, actually, to even be used in alchemy. Now, the pH, that phraseology, is more or less a mistranslation of entomology, basically how languages are made up in just sort of the genetics of a language like if you could break things down and see where certain words come from certain areas somebody somewhere along the line they wound up putting in a ph when really that particular language always wrote that sort of word with an f so it's kind of due to a mistake that is ingrained its way in some sources but yeah really it's an f sorry now, for a time, sulfur went by the name brimstone, and it also is sometimes called brimstone in sources. That was, is, an anglicized version of the phrase brennestone, which means combustible stone. It's a reference to how sulfur can easily burn and just how readily it burns. And also, too, back during this time when it was also known as brimstone, it was thought to contain hydrogen and oxygen. Basically, it was such an easy burner that they were thinking, nah, that can't just only really be one thing. There has to be something else there. And those crystals right there are one of the examples, I think, of how I said before. I mean, really, if you were to just look at that, the color on those is absolutely gorgeous. Just a beautiful, bright lemon yellow with beautiful crystals. I mean, this is something that really deserves more attention in larger collections. Now, this, of course, is not crystals like how they had before. This is an example of the many forms of sulfur. Here is a powdered version, specifically a deposit in a volcano in Indonesia. 
Now, in addition to being found in volcanoes, in general, sulfur is often found in sedimentary rocks and underground deposits. Extraction of that is often done by what you'll see being called as the fresh process or frash process. It's just how they are basically able to refine certain things and bring out the sulfur. It's also found as a product from petroleum mite refining. It's very common that way. Also through sulfide alteration as well. Now, in addition to it being very varied and everything, because, you know, if you're going to be that good, you might as well be really good. It has three crystal forms. Amorphous, or gamma sulfur, is formed when molten sulfur is rapidly cooled, which eventually turns this once pliable sulfur into the orthrhombic form. Orthrhombic crystalline sulfur is the preferred form. It's the most stable form. So that's why the other two forms actually eventually turn into orthrhombic, giving the time and certain temperature conditions, as does monoclinic. I mean, a lot of different minerals have monoclinic crystals, right? But with sulfur, it's actually only found between specimens that are between 96 and 119 degrees Celsius. And like the amorphous, once it starts cooling, it gradually reverts to the orthrhombic form. Now here is another beautiful specimen right here. This is from Bolivia. And in addition to having different crystal forms and being either crystalline or powdery, sulfur has a hardness of one and a half to two and a half. And it's also got a specific gravity of 2.07 grams per centimeter cubed. And that is just another absolutely beautiful specimen right there. I mean, it almost looks, I hate to say it, it almost looks plasticine. It's so just, the crystals are just so beautiful and intensely colored. It just doesn't look real. And the irony is, is that probably the most famous thing that people think of when they think of sulfur isn't really one of its properties at all. It's sort of kind of a misconception about it. For pure sulfur is odorless. And really that, oh shoot, who's he now? Yeah, you better run, Egg. Okay, so for now, <laughs> I just had to put that in, guys, sorry. For like the five people on YouTube that will get that reference, I love you. For those that don't, just Google the Simpsons episode, Homer the Great. But anyways, so the classic rotten egg smell is actually not pure elemental sulfur. It's hydrogen sulfide. It's very much connected to volcanism. Like when my husband and I were visiting Hawaii on our honeymoon, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of folks actually touring Volca uh, Volcano National Park, people were walking around with like handkerchiefs around their face because Kilauea was just so active at the time. It's pretty much everywhere you went was the smell of the gas. And they actually did close down the park periodically during that time because the smell was that intense. It was making people sick. I mean, you, we could walk outside our hotel room and it just smelled like spoiled eggs everywhere. Now, this is actually sulfur that's being eventually processed for its most common use, which is sulfuric acid. About 40% roughly, some countries more, some countries a little bit less, but overall on average you're looking at roughly 40% of sulfur goes into sulfuric acid, which is then used in a variety of products from just regular as, you know, acids being acids to just pesticides, insecticides, and other different things like that. Industry, a lot of acid is used in industry, whether it be etching or other things. Now, Pliny the Elder, who is probably the person that has made the most unofficial appearances on this channel, once called sulfur a most singular kind of earth and an agent of great power on other substances, referencing its ability to be involved in not only acids, but a lot of other things. Now, what were some of these other things that sulfur has found its way in? Well, starting on the right, sulfur has been historically used as a major ingredient in not only gunpowder. Allegedly, the story goes is that gunpowder was invented by directly by experimenting with sulfur. 
Now also too, fireworks are instrumental with sulfur as well, as are batteries, incesticides, fungicides, pesticides, certain say skin ointments, even eye drops. And then on the left, you're looking at a lot of different laundry uh, substances and also too, things to bleach cloth back in the day. Like just to throw out an example, the ancient Egyptians were very well known for using sulfur with processing there to basically get cloth its whitest. Also too, there are cave paintings, drawings, whatever you want to call it, because really it's not technically a painting, I guess. But that bright yellow color is from, you guessed it, sulfur. And also too, it's used in the production of paper as well. And that little symbol that kind of almost looks like a Christmas tree with a bar at the bottom of it, that is the alchemical symbol for sulfur. So once again, kind of the, the alchemist really started doing a lot of this work with chemistry and sort of the rest of the sciences just ran with it and they got the short end of the stick. And while yes, they did some things that were bonkers, they really laid the foundations for a lot of sciences. Now, something that sulfur is always connected with, for better or for worse, is, you know, spooky, creepy type of stuff. Now, a lot of that is people do say they credit it to being found around volcanoes so often. And it's also definitely because of the smell. A terrible smell like that automatically conjures up, say, negative thoughts, negative emotions. So it's understandable that back in the day, before people were really aware of things and could know better, that they were sort of smelling this and just thinking, oh my gosh, you know, something terrible has to be nearby. And so sulfur got to be, have this link to things that were, say, evil, demonic, whatever word that you want to use, when really, again, it's just a very common element found in so many different places that's absolutely beautiful and very useful as well. It also too burns with a blue flame, which is probably something that people looked at in the beginning and was just, uh, yeah, I don't like that, which is, you know, sadly, one of the many times in history that people have looked at something that they didn't understand and they ascribed a negative connotation to it. Also as well, sulfur's been uh, associated with witches for uh, quite, a, quite a long time in history. All, all of that, that negative reputation is very undeserved. Now, another final source and something that people are looking at in terms of sulfur is they're examining its role in space. Like that is actually the moon Io. Now that is yellow for a reason. It's because huh, that girl is a heck ton of sulfur up there. It's, and so people are examining it because sulfur is so integral to even life on this planet. It's, you're kind of looking at things into how much, well, if they have that much sulfur, can they have this much of another element? Can that support that type of chemical reaction? So that's something that people are examining out in space right now is sulfur's role in, say, geology of other astral bodies and also in their geochemistry. And also, too, it's found in a double-digit percentage of meteorites as well, a reflection of just how much it is in space, too. And so with that lovely note right there, Io next to the meteorites, I hope that you found this wonderful. If you're seeing us on YouTube, don't forget to give us a like and subscribe. I can't believe I'm starting to say that, but you guys are doing great things for the channel and we thank you very much. So thank you for joining us this October and we'll see you back with some new topics come November. Bye then.